Hey there, what are you doing? Just looking at birds. Welcome. I'm your host, Chris. Join me as I interview avid birders to learn more about birds, birding, and those who love both. Today, my guest is Jeff Babson, an all-around naturalist with a particular interest in birds, insects, reptiles, and plants. Jeff currently works for the Pima County Department of Natural Resources, Parks and Recreation as the county's wildlife viewing program specialist. That's quite a lot to fit onto a business card. He also owns Sky Island Tours, an environmental education and eco-tour company. Jeff has led birding tours for the Tucson Botanical Gardens, Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, and several birding f- festivals in Southern Arizona. It's good to have you on today. Thank you, Chris. Very happy to be here. As a self-described all-around naturalist that is evidenced by the variety of roles you've taken on, which role began this sprawling journey? It began with birds. When I was just a little kid, uh, kindergarten age, I was one of those who would I was always outside turning over rocks, um, looking at flowers, looking in the water. We lived near a little stream, and I'd always be looking for, you know, frogs and stuff in the water. But birds really caught my attention because they were everywhere. They were colorful. They were very active. Um, They made these wonderful sounds. And so they were a very easy uh, introduction into everything else because some of the other things were not quite so obvious, or at least not obvious all the time. When you grow up in New England and it gets to be wintertime, you're not going to see a lot of butterflies or dragonflies flying around, but there's always going to be birds. And we had feeders up in the, in the, in the backyard and we'd see things like tufted titmice and dark eyed juncos and black capped chickadees. And it didn't matter how cold and snowy it was. These birds were there and they seemed Mm -hmm. like they were thriving. And I thought that was, you know, I thought that was really cool. So, uh, it really began, uh, my grandfather, uh, got me as a birthday gift the golden guide uh, the the guide with the three buntings on the cover and it was my first real f- bird field guide and I didn't know anything I was you know five or six at the time and I would just thumb through that book all the time we'd go to the grocery store and I'd be in the car and I'd be thumbing through the book and <laughs> be waiting in the doctor's office thumbing through the book and everywhere I went I took that thing with me I wore it out but it introduced me to uh, this world that I didn't even know existed. Um, and that was the, the first uh, grasp of, of birds into my life. And then as life, my life has gone on, I've uh, become interested in a lot of other things. I actually went to college to study sharks, but hmm. not a lot of sharks in Arizona. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so it's kind of, you know, come back to birds. And, and I feel very fortunate to... Um, live here because we have such a phenomenal diversity of birds that people come literally from around the world to see. And yet, yeah. you know, we have them anytime we want to get in the car and make a short drive, we can look at them. And th- I think that's absolutely wonderful. Sure. When you think about birding, what do you enjoy most about it? Um, I think a, the, the being outside is a big part of it. I'm one of those people I've been pretty lucky in my life where I've never really had been anchored to a desk. Uh, you know, in my mind, that's almost like punishment. Um, so I'm fortunate to be outdoors most of the time. Um, I love that. I love the, the adventure because whenever you go out you never know what you're going to see, yeah. um, there's that sort of anticipation that happens. And I, it's just a, it's a, it's an experience where, especially over the last you know, 15 months, that I found it very, very uh, reassuring when, you know, 2020 was such a struggle for everyone. I could go outside, you know, walk around my backyard or walk down the street and be out in the desert and look at, and look at birds. And it seemed like everything was going to be all right at some level. We, We had some, some difficulties to get through, but, uh, I, I thought, it was for me last year um being having the opportunity to go out a lot was 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 good for the soul and i think it's i think that's part of it for a lot of folks that that you know they have high pressure jobs or maybe they have a job where they are inside a lot and this gives them a chance to sort of recharge their batteries because we need we absolutely need the natural world out there and yeah. we are 
a part of it and having the opportunity to go out, you know, whether it's once a week or once a day, you know, it, it gives us a chance to, you know, sort of get back in touch with the natural world and forget, you know, a lot of the issues that are going on, you know, with your work or your, you know, anything and, and get out and, and sort of get free from that. So yeah. it's kind of a combination of those things. Um, plus the birds are just so darn cool that <laughs> it's fun to look at them anyways. But, but getting outside is a big part of it for me. You touched a little bit on where your birding journey began with the Golden Guide. If you think back further, what is your earliest memory of a bird? Um, a good question. The, the earliest one I can remember, like I said, we had a creek that went through our backyard. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of red-winged blackbirds. And we would see American coots and things like that. But one of the birds that really caught my attention when I was just a kid was the mallard. Mm. They are beautiful birds. Yeah. And... You know, we as a as a birding community tends to um, have this, I guess, value system where <laughs> if something's really common, it's less valued than something that's either more colorful or more rare or or what or, or bigger, sure. or or whatever. And so, you know, the mallard, these everybody, almost probably around the world has seen a mallard before. But when you look at a Drake mallard with that yellow bill and the green head, they are just snazzy birds. And, and that was one of the ones that really caught my attention early. And I would go back to my field guide and I'd look and I'd say, oh, I know that guy. That's that one right there. Mm -hmm. And the um, females are equally beautiful. They're just more subtle in their beauty, which is the case in a lot of birds. So sure. I, I think, you know, one of the ones I remember, these, we had this, this little creek was maybe five feet wide at the most, and, and they'd be paddling around in it, and it, and it didn't matter. It would, you know, sometimes it would be, there would be snow falling in the, in the spring when they had migrated back, and, and they're still swimming around in this <laughs> freezing cold water. And I'm, you know, I, how are they not just yeah. frozen, you know, and they would, they seemed to enjoy it. So it was, it was a bird that is very common, but certainly caught my attention early on. Yeah. You talked a little bit about the birds you see, appreciating the birds that are around you uh, when you go out on a walk, just being open to discovery. But do you have a bird that you're thinking about that you would like to see next? Where when you go out, you wonder, you know what, I'd like to see this bird. Not really, in the sense that when, you know, if, if you look through a book and say, oh, I really want to see that. I, to be honest with you, this is going to sound like a sort of corny answer. I want to see all of them. Mm. I know that's an unattainable goal, but I do want to see all of them. At the same time, I don't want to um, sort of forget about the birds that I see every day either. Yeah. And so I don't really, I don't keep a life list. I don't say, I'm not a chaser where if a rarity shows up somewhere, I don't get in my car immediately and drive to the spot to try to yeah. find it. That's not how I personally like to approach it. There's a lot of people who do it that way, and that's perfectly fine. It's just not how I would like to approach it. Yeah. And so for me, there, there's not like a species that, that uh, I have in, in mind, but whatever the next bird is would be fine with me. And that I don't know if that <laughs> necessarily was where you thought the question would go. I mean, they're, they're all great. Um, there's birds all around the world that, are absolutely knock your socks off beautiful or have these really interesting behaviors or again, the rarity or their localized distribution. But we have all that here too. And uh, I think for me, because of the way I approach birding, I don't, I don't really think of it that way. I think yeah. it more of um, let's just go out and see what we can see today. And whatever we see is going to be great. It's a good way to look at it. I do agree that question is kind of biased towards maybe a lister, but no, it's I mean it's a just it's fine. perfectly <laughs> legitimate question. But, but the, 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 it would be hard if I if I were to think I'd think I'd say oh there's that one yeah that'd be really cool to see oh so would this one and then that oh now now I'm back to you know and pretty soon it would be all the birds out there again so <laughs> I I just 
like all of them. I'm one of those that would be perfectly happy watching house sparrows yeah. all day because they, they do interesting things, you sure. know, and they're very approachable. So I don't have a particular species that I, that I really want to see next. They're all good to me. That's fair. When you think about those that are new to birding, what would be a piece of advice you might share with those people? There's a couple of things. Uh, number one is focus. When it comes to identification, I think the single best approach is to focus on size and shape mm -hmm. before you're looking at colors and patterns. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is um, size and shape is much less variable. So mm. to give you an example, the yellow rumped warbler, common warbler around southern Arizona, common warbler in, in much of North America. Uh, you have the breeding male plumage, you have the breeding female plumage, you have the winter adult male plumage, you have the winter adult female plumage, then you have the immature males and the immature females. So that's mm. six different plumages for one species of bird, and we have however many, you know, 900, almost 900 in North sure. America, and they don't all show that variation. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to uh, memorize field marks, it can get kind of overwhelming pretty quickly. However, yeah. size and shape is not going to change for e any of that. You know, yeah. the males and the females, the young and the adults are all going to be about the same size and the same shape. So I would focus on that. When I mean shape, there's sort of a couple of things that come to mind. Um, mm. What shape is the bill and how long or short is it? So okay. a sparrow bill looks very different from a hummingbird bill, yeah. to use a really obvious example. So those two species, would, you know, those two groups would never likely be confused with each other. Yeah. Uh, the same, now, it must make it a little bit more realistic. Uh, a warbler and a vireo, those are bird, mm. two groups of birds that are often foraging up in the trees. They're quite active could easily be confused with each other, sure. especially if they're way up high in a tree and you can't get a really good look at them. Yeah. But if you do get a good look, the vireo bill is very different from the, the warbler bill. Warbler mm -hmm. bill is like a fine pair of tweezers, mm -hmm. whereas if you look at the vireo bill, if you took like a jay's bill, mm -hmm. a Mexican jay, and shrunk it, <laughs> that's what it looks like. So, the, you know, so the size and, and length or shortness of the bill, the length of the tail, short versus long. And by that, it's, it's kind of a relativity thing. So when you look at the body of, bird, of a bird, yeah. you wouldn't necessarily know if it's a long tail or a short tail by just sure. looking at the, at the bird. Well, how long is the tail relative to the body of the bird? Mm. You know, does it look like it's about right? Does it look like it's longer than... You know, it's like two sizes too big, two sizes too small, yeah. that sort of thing. And, and that's going to give you, I think, a much more solid foundation when it comes to identifying birds. And, and our, it, it's tricky. You have to train yourself to think that way because our brains, are very, our brains and eyes are very good at detecting colors and patterns sure. and then interpreting them. So you kind of have to put your brain, you know, on a pause for a second while you're studying the size and shape. And then once you have a pretty good idea, hopefully you'll have a pretty good idea what group it goes to, then is when you look at the colors and patterns, because that will usually help you to um, figure out which species it is you're actually looking at. So yeah. it's kind of the, I think it's sort of a reverse approach than, than what a lot of people think or what a lot of people try to do when they're first starting. Sure. And then also, Enjoy it. It's fun. But be in the moment. When you have a bird in front of you, take in all that that bird is offering you. To me, when you have a mystery bird show up and you're not sure what it is, it's kind of, to me, like an episode of CSI in that all of the evidence is there for us to identify. We yeah. just have to figure out what's important evidence and what is a red herring. Yeah. And so by studying the birds by studying where they are, what they're doing. Are they on the ground? Are they up in the trees? Are they staying relatively still? Are they moving around a lot? Time of year. Yeah. Some birds are here in the winter. Some birds are here in the summer. Some are here year-round. Those are the good ones to learn because you'll sure. see them every day. Um, the habitat you're in, uh, if they're making sounds, um, all of that's evidence to help you arrive in identification. And when you've been doing it for a while, a bird will fly by, and, and most people have probably experienced this, where they're on a, a bird walk with someone, and the bird flies by across the trail or whatever. You're not even sure it was a bird, maybe, because it was yeah, so fast. fast. And then the, the leader will say, oh, that was a so-and-so. And, 
you might be like, how the heck did he or she know that was what that was? Well, they're yeah. taking its probability for where they are, the time of year, and then a quick assessment of the size and shape of that thing. Hmm. Now, are they correct? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe not. But more than likely, with experience, they're going to be pretty, pretty dead close. on. Yeah. yeah. Outside of field guides and apps, what is something that you've purchased for less than $100 that has had the largest impact on your birding experience? There's, again, a couple of things. One of them is free, and there's two books that, that I think are very, very useful for learning kind of what to look for mm. when you're trying to identify them. And one is the um, Field Guide to Advanced Birding by Ken Kaufman. Okay. And I think, and I've actually had the pleasure of being out with Ken before, and I actually mentioned to him that this would be a textbook for birding. And, and you could take the word advanced out of the title. Yeah. The second half of the book does go into some of the more tricky species pairs to tell apart. But oh. the first part of the book has loads of information that every birder should read, like the first roughly 100 pages. So that book is fantastic. Another book that came out four or five years ago. It's in the Peterson Reference Guide series. Okay. Uh, it's Birding by Impression hmm. by Kevin Carlson and Dale Rossellette uh, from New Jersey. And that's basically using size and shape, what they call general impression, hmm. to identify birds, what to look for. And both of those are really good because they help you to train your brain on to how to think in a way that's going to be uh, more useful when yeah. identifying birds, but it may not be a way to think when you're first starting. Mm. Uh, so those are both very useful books. And then the other thing, and this is the free part, is go on bird walks. Mm. No matter where you are, there are very likely there is a bird club, an Audubon Society, a nature club, a national park, a county park, some organization that's running bird walks in your local neighborhood or in local area and go out with them because those people are, first of all, they're interested in birds just like you. So you, you share a common, uh, a common passion, yeah. but you'll also learn stuff when you go out. There. And many of them, not all of them, but many of them are free, mm -hmm. which is a good price for, for yes. anything. So, you know, here, you know, locally, Tucson, you know, Tucson Audubon Society leads a whole bunch of walks. Uh, Pima County, we lead a, a bunch of walks. Tucson Botanical Gardens, Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. There's a lot of local places leading leading walks, but that's true anywhere. anywhere. Yeah. So, so take advantage of it. Okay, now let's move on to our bird segment, where my guests have a chance to share a bit about a bird of their choice. Uh, and for this episode, Jeff has chosen the Montezuma quail. Where are these quail typically found? So these just improbable-looking birds are found in the higher reaches of, like, semi-desert grasslands all the way up to conifer forests. So they have a fairly broad elevational range, but they're usually found most commonly in sort of oak juniper woodlands. So mm. small oak trees, small junipers, lots of grasses in between. And they occur in in southern Pima County, the southeastern corner of the state, basically. Okay. And I've seen them in, in many different areas, but they're hard birds to find. Mm. They're probably fairly common. It's just they're really hard birds to find because they're quail, right? And so yeah. Quail spend a lot of time on the ground. One of their defense tactics is to freeze if something's coming. So you're walking mm -hmm. along. The bird's going to hear you. I don't care how quiet we think we're being. We're making a lot of noise. Yeah. So they'll hear us coming, and then they'll freeze. And mm -hmm. even though when you look at them in a, field, in a field guide, you would say, oh, that's how hard can that bird be to find? Well, the reality is they really blend in extraordinarily well. And I've I've been on a trip, uh, multiple trips, where they're literally within feet of us oh, wow. and people can't see them hmm. because they blend in so well. So even though when you look in a field guide, the thing should be easy to spot, it's, it's, not, it's not that simple. Plus, with their behavior of freezing, you know, one of, our eyes are really good at detecting movement, right? So if something's not moving, we're much less likely to detect it. And that's, sure. that's kind of their first line of defense. And then if you get close enough... 
they'll kind of do the quail thing and they'll burst from the ground and 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 flight and then they'll fly a short distance and you won't see them again because they they hit the ground running and and by the time you've collected your wits about you you're not even sure what that just was, you know, because your your heart went up in your throat and, and all that. But oak juniper woodlands are the most the habitat where they're in the most often is yeah. what I would say. You speak about their first line of defense and some of their defense mechanisms. When you think of that, what are their predators? So if you're a quail, uh, whether you're a gambles quail here in in the Sonoran Desert or a Montezuma quail up a little bit higher elevation or like a northern Bob White in eastern North America, you're on the menu from from the egg stage to the adult stage. Mm. You're on the menu for for everything from snakes, Gila monsters in our area will eat the mm. eggs. Even birds, you know, that, that a lot of people don't really think of uh, could be predators like curve-billed thrashers or even Gila woodpeckers might prey on the newly hatched young or the eggs. Because they're ground nesters? It's because it's not so much to me that they're ground nesters. It's just that they have large clutches. Oh. And so when you have, you know, their clutch size is frequently, you know, 14, hmm. give or take a couple. So... When you have that many little babies running around, it makes a lot of a ruckus, right? So it's fairly easy for predators. No, I shouldn't say easy. Predators can find them a bit easier than, say, a yellow warbler nesting in the top of a tree, right? Because they only have like, you know, three or four babies and they're up high and a lot of things don't even see them. So snakes, Gila monster, probably about the only lizard that would feed on them. Birds, mammals, Hmm. raccoons, skunks, coatis. Bobcats, coyotes, and that's actually the reason why quail have so many young. Hmm. They have so many predators that out of that group of, you know, 12 or 14, maybe one or two of them might make it to adulthood. Oh, wow. And so that's sort of their evolutionary adaptation to high predation pressure. So we're in that category as well. They're, they're both, you know, many quail are hunted. Yeah. Um, or they're game birds. And so, you know, we're, we're a predator as well, never mind our cars and stuff. And I mean, <laughs> Montezuma quail don't get hit by cars very often because there aren't many roads, but, sure. you know, gambles quail certainly do. Yeah. Uh, and so they're, they're fed on by a lot of things. Hmm. You talked about how they might freeze when they detect movement, how they're often hidden behind tall grass. If I wanted to approach one for a better look, and if I knew that this area had them... Mm-hmm. What would be the best way to do so? Move very stealthily. You know, no quick movements, almost, I don't want to say robotic, but sort of, you know, slow and quiet. You don't want to cross that fateful step Hmm. where everything's fine until they all decide they've flown away. So a good way to photograph quail is to, if you see them, take a picture from where you are, Mm -hmm. take a couple steps forward. If they're still there, take another picture. Yeah. And sometimes you can get really close to them. I mean, like I said, I've been within five feet of them, and mm. they just, they're not moving. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of a, it's a strange thing. and it, it seems like there's two different things going on at once in the sense that they freeze, but then they're going to move. And yet, you know, when are they going to move? Because you yeah. can get really close to them. Another thing you can do is if, and it's not uncommon to see Montezuma quail crossing quiet roads. Mm. It, use your vehicle as a blind. Wildlife in general doesn't perceive vehicles as threats, but if we're out there walking, yeah. they're going to be more likely to get away from us at a further distance. If that opportunity presents itself, that's another way you could do it. But I think slow, quiet, restrained motion will allow you to get pretty close to them and like i said their their natural defense is to freeze yeah. and so they don't want to really move either but mm. the, the trick is knowing how close you can get without going that one step too far when they do leave that's why i like to take a photo move a couple take a photo move a couple because at least you can get some some really good images that way yeah. and if you're really lucky the birds will stay right there and as you get, you get a, you get a um, frame filling image of a <laughs> of a quail, and that would just be fantastic. You know, and that's true for a lot of uh, birds the, the, that approach. And if you have a lens, if you have a, a zoom lens, you can obviously get really nice images from a, from further away. Sure, but like with a point and shoot, that's the method I would use. Yeah, we've mentioned a few of the Montezuma quail's predators, but what do they eat? 
So Montezuma quail, they have a little bit of a dietary shift um, from the dry season like we're getting into now as opposed to the wet season. So throughout the year, they'll feed on seeds, fruits, small arthropods, small insects, small spiders, things of that nature, very much like a gambles quail would. Mm. However, when it gets to the dry season, they tend to feed more than gambles quail do on things like bulbs, hmm. you know, the, the fleshy roots of some plants. Yeah. And my hypothesis as to why they're doing that is because of the water. It's more succulent tissue, yeah. and it's the dry part of the year. I don't see um, gambles quail doing that, but, but Montezuma quail definitely do. And, so, and they'll feed on, you know, a wide variety of seeds. They as far as I know, they're not specialists on anything, but yeah. you know where they live. There's lots of grasses, so that's grass seeds are probably an important part of their diet. Uh, the annuals, the you know the spring annuals, if there's been sufficient rainfall, that'll be another uh, key part of their diet. And then once you know when the young have hatched and they're starting to run around, then they're probably feeding uh, more on insects at that time, just because of the proteins and yeah. uh, other nutrients in, in insects that aren't as readily available in seeds. So if you're trying to grow new tissue and get bigger, that's a better food source. Helpful. Similar in many ways to a gambles quail. You know, the, you know, the plant species are probably different, but in general, it's pretty similar. Yeah. We talked about the size of the nest, how there could be 14 eggs mm -hmm. in that nest, yet... Unlike a gambles quail where we might find their nest in our backyard, it's not very common to find a Montezuma quail nest in your backyard. Where do they usually nest? So they're ground nesters. They usually will site their nest under like a clump of grass or under a shrub that gives the incubating female some protection from not only predators, but also the sun you know, and shade and, and so protection from the heat. And so they're... Nests, this is true of most bird nests, uh, they're not meant to be found, right? Mm -hmm. That you know, That's kind of one of the key traits of most bird nests is they don't, birds don't want them to be found. So they're difficult to locate. But if you, you wanted to, to look for them, it's kind of like looking for a gambles quail nest. You look under tr shrubs, you look under glass clumps. I wouldn't look in a flower pot. Uh, yeah. because there's, you know, the Montezuma quail don't nest where there's many flower pots, whereas the Gambles quail do. And if presented the opportunity, they might very well nest yeah. in a flower pot. But typically they're going to be under some sort of vegetation to gain protection. And quail eggs are really interesting in that for many birds, they'll start to incubate when the first egg is laid. Mm -hmm. Uh, for for birds the size of a quail or a sparrow, the females typically lay one egg per day until the clutch is complete. So mm. there are records of uh, Montezuma quail having up to 14 eggs. Oh. They average around 11, but they have up to 14 eggs. So that first egg is laid. It can be almost two weeks before the clutch is complete if it's oh. the average clutch size. Yeah. For normal birds, that first egg would have died the embryo would have died inside of it because it can't stay cool for that long. Yeah. So the quail eggs, uh, the quail have adapted to having the eggs have a much more broad temperature tolerance hmm. such that if they, yeah, that, that first egg or two that's laid, there's going to be a lengthy period of time before it gets incubated. Yeah. But yet the embryo survives, the clutch is complete, the female starts to incubate, Two weeks or so later, the eggs hatch, and that's where it becomes important for that egg-laying strategy, mm. or I should say egg incubation strategy. And that is because, just like Gamble's quail, all the, la all the nestlings, they come out of the nest on the same, you know, usually within a fairly short period of time, and they yeah. all leave the nest together never to come back. Whereas if, if the female quail were to incubate starting with the first egg, mm -hmm. by the time the last egg is laid, it still has two weeks of incubation, and you're going to have babies of all these different ages coming back to the nest, and they, they would just get picked off left and right. Mm. So it's a trait that quail have that most birds don't have. I'm, I'm sure there's many other birds, like especially in that group of what we call the game birds or the gallinaceous birds, so quail, pheasants, partridges, things of that nature, okay. that are all kind of in the same boat. Pheasants are a little bit different just because of their size. They're a little yeah. bit bigger birds. But uh, you know, things like partridges and ptarmigan, um, they, they very likely have a similar strategy for the same reason. Okay. Hmm. 
All right, for this last question, I would like to touch on something we discussed before we started recording. I asked you about a subject that you're passionate about, and you mentioned the idea of making birding more accessible. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. So birds offer all of us uh, a great way to experience the natural world. And in my view, birds are for everyone. And it, it should not matter where you live, your, your interests. If you're interested in birds, you should be welcomed by the birding community, uh, regardless of race, religion, any of that stuff. And so what has sort of been, an, uh, not an issue, but a, a concern of mine is that, you know, I've been leading bird tours for 20 years. And for the most part, the people who come on the birding walks are people who look like me. You know, I'm a Caucasian male in, in my 50s. But yet we know that there's, you know, especially like if you live in Tucson, any community, very diverse, you know, yeah. as far as all kinds of things. And none of the other aspects of your life should matter. You should be interested in birds. And there's kind of three different, I think, audiences that the birding community is trying to reach but could do a better job. Hmm. One is the youth. Yeah. Um, young birders are the future of birding, and many of them are phenomenally talented. And, you know, they have those young eyes. They have those young ears. They're really passionate. They're really fantastic. And, th and th so those kids are well on their way, yeah. right? But what about the kids who are in the same classrooms that they are that, you know, may be interested in birds but maybe – you know, their family is not interested in the natural world, or maybe they don't have the financial resources to purchase a pair of binoculars, or, you know, maybe they can't drive to the local national park to see birds because the public transportation doesn't go there. So, you know, we should, as the, we being the birding community, should encourage, recruit Kids like that, all kids, not just, I mean, all kids are, would be welcome. All people are welcome. But there's probably millions of kids out there who could become avid birders if we just gave them the opportunity. So I think the birding community should do what it can to, to create that opportunity. Another group that we're not really reaching very well is the disabled folks. Mm -hmm. And there's a movement that got started a few years ago. It's called the Birdability. Yeah. And it's, you know, there's uh, Virginia. Um, she was one of the founders. She fell off a horse when she was a kid and, and uh, um, got, you know, paralyzed. But she's, she's one of the leaders in this whole movement. She spoke, uh, I know, at Tucson Audubon, they had a, a talk. These are f folks that they may not be able to hike up a mountainside, but we can go to parks that have maybe paved or groomed trails that they can go out and be out in nature and, and looking at birds. And, and I've started to do some programs over the last uh, couple of months that we're going to continue that's basically focused on trying to recruit people who are new to birding, hmm. regardless of anything else. If you can get to the park, we're going to go look at birds. And, and there's another sort of aspect to that and that's another movement called slow birding okay which um is basically let's not make a track meet out of it and try to tick off as many species as we possibly can within a time period and then move on to the next location this approach is exactly what it says you, you move at a slow pace um, you focus on noticing things of behavior and listen for birds and, you know, get a better opportunity to study size and shape and things of that nature. And so sure. you might only see 15 species in two hours, but mm -hmm. during that two hours, you might have learned more about that bird than, than someone who saw 30 species in an hour and then moved on to something else. Yeah. And so I think uh, sometimes slowing down to take a look at what birds are actually doing is very useful. And so that approach with um, disabled birders is a good way to do the slow birding. It's also great with young birders. And the third group we're not reaching are the inner city or lower income communities. You know, every community has some, you know, those folks often get ignored when it comes to this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And 
the way I look at it is every single person who becomes interested in birds can now become an advocate for the birds. Mm -hmm. There's no bad thing about that. You know, why would we not want more advocates for birds? And by being advocates for birds, now you're advocates for the wildflowers, the butterflies, the dragonflies, the the reptiles, because, you know, birds are sort of an umbrella group. You know, if we protect the birds, we're going to protect a lot of other things in the process. And not only will we protect them, but we'll give future generations the opportunity to be awed by the birds that we're seeing today. So obviously people are working hard to attract new birders into the flock, so to speak, but we could do better, I think. And um, and it's a thing that any of us could do. You don't have to be any leader or even a member of an organization. If you have someone who, maybe it's your child or grandchild, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe if you work at a school, maybe it's one of your students who's, who seems to have a particular interest in birds, then you can become the mentor. You can take anybody out to your local patch, wherever that is, and you can introduce those folks to the world of birds and have them the opportunity to share in what you love so much. And yeah. and, and the reality is, is some people may go out once or twice and decide that, you know, maybe they don't like birds. That's fine. I mean, but we don't know until we give them the opportunity to do so. And And I think we could all do a better job of that. So aside from more focused efforts into birdability or into slow birding, it's as simple as just pointing out some of these birds when mm-hmm. we're with yeah. other people. Absolutely. Who may not be as interested in birds as us, but just giving them that opportunity. Correct. You could be you know, talking to your neighbor at the mailbox and see a northern cardinal. Oh, there's a northern cardinal. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know you. I mean, and that that simple interaction could be a starting point. You just never know. And, and, and so... That's the thing every single one of us can do. Uh, You don't need to be any quote-unquote expert. I I, Personally, I I kind of have a hard time with that term because, Mm -hmm. sure, some people know more about birds than others, but any of us truly experts? I mean, the people who I think the the new birders or maybe the intermediate birders are calling experts, I think most of them would say, if you ask them, they would say they still have so much to learn about birds. So, well, I can see it from, you know, from one standpoint, uh, a lot of the the leaders and uh, the authors of these field guides and stuff, I think if you talk to them, they would say that they still have a lot to learn. You know, they may learn no more than you, but they still have a lot to learn. So um, it's just getting out there. And if you have someone that you think might be interested just ask them if they want to go look at birds, and you could just walk down the street. You don't have to go anywhere. Birds yeah. are everywhere. You don't have to go anywhere special. Just look at the bird. Have her come to have the person come to your house. Yeah. If you have feeders up, and just sit in the backyard and watch the birds. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. You just have to start the process, and hopefully, you know, you, we'll recruit a new birder to the to the fold, and and that'll be great for the birds. So, yes, it's easy. All right, I'd like to thank Jeff for joining us today. I'd like to thank you for listening to this podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, please follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you are listening to this episode from. While you're there, I would appreciate it if you left a rating or review to help more people discover the podcast. You can visit lookingatbirds.com for show notes, a transcript of the episode, and pictures of the Montezuma quail, along with some of the other birds that we talked about today. Until next time, keep looking at birds.